this is, it's been a depressing afternoon and it continues. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that I think is interesting as I've listened to the speakers earlier today is the conversation around um, mothers and fathers of incarcerated who have, who have been incarcerated and you know, this, this conversation continues that line of kind of thinking, kind of looking at these issues and the challenging um, observations that we've made in kind of pulling this work together. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that we've come up as, come on as we've kind of approached this work of kind of looking at children of incarcerated parents. And one of the challenges that we've kind of come to is that M primarily the focus when we folks have looked at, and I know this has been said before, of children of, incar of um, incarceration, it's focused on the victims, i.e. those folks who were somehow damaged by the criminal act that have occurred, and the perpetrators. So how do we get these bad people out of their communities and into some institutional settings to kind of keep them away from everybody else? One of my colleagues and I, as, as we've been talking about this, they kind of raised the question about what about victimless crimes and how does that impact on and all of this? And we, we talked about the fact that, you know, even if that's the case, there is a victim. There is no victim. Um, we would argue that there still remains a victim within that work. And so um, as previous presenters have talked about is that most of the incarcerated individuals are parents. And so in our chapter, we try to focus that, we try to raise the, the issue that this focus then ignores what it's like to grow up with incarcerated parents. What are the long and short term effects of parental incarceration? We can answer some of these questions and how best to serve the needs of these children whose parents are incarcerated. And so, so we, we, we wanted to begin to ask individuals to kind of think about those issues kind of concretely. And so given that, we, um, we said we wanted to kind of focus the, the, the chapter on what are the um, practices that protects children from the negative consequences associated with parent incarceration. And we want to use that uh, uh, ecological perspective to kind of begin to think about that. You know, this conversation, I, I think, um, brings to the fore um, how as children grow and develop, uh, the systems within which they, they um, interact kind of are negatively, can be negatively impacted by um, this issue of incarceration. And it also raises another in, 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 um, interesting um, observation for us. I f as we were doing this work, it felt like most of the innovative, and I'll use that word kind of, use that kind of in quotation, most of the innovative things that were happening weren't happening in the U.S. Um, they were happening internationally. And, um, and I was actually kind of moved by um, the UN report on the rights of the children. And, and, and it kind of raised this question that I, ha I had to step, stop and ponder for a while, which is, should the rights of children be an important consideration in the actions concerning them? And what I mean by that is, if a parent is incarcerated, when a judge is making a decision, or the system is making a decision about what's happening with that parent, should the system take into consideration that child that's attached to that parent? And how do we, and if we did that, what does that mean then for what kind of sanctions we levy against the parent and the reciprocal impact that it may have on the child? And so, so um, I, I want to put out as a, a provocative statement to kind of have folks ponder because what if that is the case? What if, you know, um, I was arrested for a drug, um, a non-violent, non although there's no such thing as a non-violent drug offense, given the, um, the previous, um, the previous prevent presenters, but you know, what, if, what happens if I'm, I'm a mother and I have a young child? How should then my sentences, sentencing be impacted by that, if that's the case? And so, um, Kind of guiding some of this also, this uh, chapter in our conversation is kind of thinking about, and I know that other um, presenters kind of highlighted some of these issues, but um, kind of thinking about um, the theories that have been kind of put up again around kind of the effects of incarceration on children. And so I'm not going to talk about attachment theory because that's been done well here. Um, I'm not going to talk about separation anxiety theory because that's also been mentioned. Um, but and um, and I might spend I will spend like a minute talking about post traumatic stress experience because there's a way in which one can argue that if children are 
present when the apprentice is being incarcerated. I don't know about any of you, but personally speaking, I've never been in car I've been, never been arrested. <laughs> I've been close a couple of times. But um, but the you know the impact of that, you know, so I got in a car accident once and my son was in the back of the car. I'm a storyteller by the way, I'm sorry. And um, and when I got, the, I got in the accident, my son was in the back of the car and he said, Daddy, what happened? I said, well, we got in a little bit of a car accident. And he said, the police, the, is the police going to get called? And I said, yes. And he's like, are they going to arrest you? And I was just like, oh my God, I, I hadn't thought about you and me being arrested and what that means for you. And I said, well, I don't know. And then the police showed up and he's like, ooh, Daddy, they're here to get you. <laughs> That's just to mean my, my son have a little bit of a... Um, uh, antagonistic relationship. <laughs> and so, but while we were jesting, I was kind of mulling over the idea of him watching me be arrested and how that would impact his own development. And so, and so one of the things that comes up there is that even if the child is not present and, you know, um, you know, we know that children can have very fantastic imaginations. So even if they weren't physically there, or if they were physically there, the lingering impacts of that, that, um, that arrest could have post-traumatic experiences for those children in, in kind of, and, and then negatively impact their development. And so our hope then is to kind of begin to expand our thinking across the ecological systems because if we're talking about um, looking at interventions or thinking about how, the, how incarceration affects children and what we might be, be able to do to mitigate them, we have to kind of think from a number of different perspectives. And so recognizing that as we move across the ecological systems, how do we evaluate them, how do we think about them, and how do we can go about um, implementing them. So um, that's my introduction to, the, to what it is that we were trying to write about, and I'm going to turn to my colleagues to kind of continue to, the conversation. So we've already heard quite a bit about the effects of parental incarceration on child outcomes, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. Um, beyond kind of highlighting that there's um, multiple, multiple problems that are happening at the same time, and often these are not happening in isolation. Um, and so thinking from a systemic approach, many of these children are disadvantaged to begin with. Um, they come from areas of concentrated poverty. Um, parental incarceration reduces the likelihood that that family and those children will be able to move out of poverty. Um, they tend to have poor educational opportunities in school systems from the beginning. Um, and um, some studies have shown, although research is not completely consistent in this area, um, that there's um, some problems in school, low achievement, lower GPA, um, higher dropout rates in some areas. Um, research has also most consistently, I think, shown that, especially for boys who have their dads incarcerated, there's an increased risk of behavior problems, um, and there's stigma that's associated with having a parent incarcerated. Um, but again, thinking about a more broad perspective on how parental incarceration impacts children, um, we can think about kind of a continuum where we might want to start with kind of prevention efforts aimed at parents. Um, and then when, if it does happen, kind of shift our focus to different levels of intervention over time. I also want to note that um, we are focusing really on incarceration in prisons uh, most generally, and so we miss all of those other points of contact that really could um, have an impact in terms of trauma um, and other negative outcomes um, from arrest all the way through the reentry process. So as we started to conceptualize and think about um, what interventions actually look like and what effective interventions are for children, with incarcerated parents, um, we became depressed um, as <laughs> um, were kind of highlighted in the previous presentations. Um, and so what we really thought was important was to think about what actually are components of effective interventions, um, and not just thinking about this at the individual level, but thinking that this could occur across multiple levels. Um, so children, families, caretakers, as well as institutions, which I feel has mis been missing a little bit from this discussion today, that we may be intervening at the wrong level, um, thinking about shifting policies in prisons and jails to make 
more family friendly settings or um, target interventions at changing those policies specifically. Um, but what we came up with is that interventions that are effective tend to be theory driven. Um, so there is some empirical basis. Um, and so we want research to support the theory behind any intervention that's developed. Um, and this can actually help to identify effective program components. And this can be done in collaboration with community members and practitioners who are delivering programs um, that they believe work even though we really don't know if they actually do work. Um, and then we have contextual factors that need to be considered. So that's one program component. Um, and so, for example, we want to know where would the intervention occur, where would it be the most effective? Is it going to be effective in a prison setting, or maybe it's during the reentry process? Um, is it going to be most effective for the parent and the child and the caretaker, or one of those um, demographic populations? We also want to think about context in the sense that we may need to match interventions to specific groups of children. So, um, gender pathways theory would suggest that um, girls who have moms who are incarcerated are at a higher risk for incarceration themselves um, and the same pathways such for boys. So maybe we need specific interventions that target girls who have moms who are incarcerated and boys who have dads who are incarcerated and thinking more broadly about how context and different factors may influence the development of interventions and what an effective intervention could look like. We also have structural elements, and so this is <clears throat> really in some ways thinking about fidelity. Um, how, how much of a program do we actually need? Um, what's the dose? What's the strength? Um, adherence? How many people do you actually need to participate in the program? How many sessions do you need? Um, essentially any resource that you actually need to support the program. And finally, the specific intervention practices. So what's actually being delivered? What's the content that's actually being delivered? Why is it assumed that this content would make a change? And so that's where we go back to the theory and hope that there's some theoretical guideline that could support um, the change-making process. Um, so that's pretty broad, and if we think about the National Institute of Health, um, this is actually their model for developing effective interventions in clinical research. And so, you know, what we've talked a lot about today, studies will actually stop probably, I don't know, at stage zero or one, um, because we're not actually going through the process of doing rigorous research. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this model before, Basically, stage zero is basic research. So we're figuring out what the needs of the population actually are, um, what most people have talked about today. Um, st stage one is where you develop the, and refine the intervention. So this could, again, be done in collaboration with the community. It doesn't have to be done from a research pers perspective at all. It, can, it should be a collaboration. Um, and so when you de develop the intervention, the next step is efficacy research. And so that's stage two. Um, usually this is done in a controlled environment, although sometimes you can see the line from stage one to stage three, where sometimes it goes right into the community. Um, now the nice thing is that the solid lines are actually acceptable pathways. The dotted lines are where you want to exercise caution. Um, and so if we go to from stage one intervention development to stage three in the community and we show some effects, then we can go do a full effectiveness trial and understand whether or not the program works, hopefully gather some external validity, and then we would want to implement and disseminate the program. This is an iterative process. It doesn't go in one cycle. These lines will go back and forth. You may have to go back and do basic research after you figure out some of your program components aren't working. Um, so we really wanted to pay attention and be mindful of what actually would be an effective intervention for kids of incarcerated parents. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Hello, I'm Christina Campbell. I'm a community psychologist by training. I'm currently a professor at the University of Cincinnati in the Department of uh, Criminal Justice. Um, this slide here sort of outlines, if at least the first five bullets sort of outline the types of programs that might have an indirect or direct impact on children outcomes. Uh, of the programs that are listed here, uh, the first is program education courses. 
And uh, this would be one of the most common uh, types of programs that will be available for parents of incarcerated um, children. Uh, most of these programs are gonna be housed within uh, female facilities followed by male facilities and then th uh, f facilities that um, are co-gender. Uh, the next program is parent support groups. Um, the next is, uh, will deal, you can sort of classify as uh, a program or service that will provide legal assistance around custody needs of their children. Uh, the next will be uh, involving visitations, which sometimes will um, involve face-to-face -face contact. Um, other times it might not involve any direct contact at all. Uh, the next classification we might uh, consider is special visits. And this sometimes includes uh, events or activities like overnight stays. And last but not least, uh, we can sort of have a sixth group and think about direct services that are offered to children. Uh, this might be offered in the community. It may not involve the parent who's incarcerated. But if we take a look at the first five programs, which is one way we can think about the programs available for incarcerated parents, a lot of these programs may or may not include uh, the youth. Um, for example, if we take a look at the education or support groups, uh, sometimes parents in these conditions will be learning skills that they may not be able to apply uh, right away, right? They may not ap apply these skills until they're released uh, from the facilities. And what's important here, and one thing that we would like to sort of emphasize and make sure we make note um, in the chapter is that there are limited programs that are going to be directly focused on the child, uh, the caregiver who's gonna be responsible for that child, um, as well as making sure that there's uh, resources available for that parent as they transition back into the community. This here is to extend our conversation around the ecological model, right? If we're thinking about children outcomes, the children should remain at the center of the conversation and also the child-parent relationship. And there's different ways or different models that we can use. And we can use this model like we've done today with really thinking about the problem or the social issues from a very comprehensive uh, sort of level. But we can think about this as a way to think about where we want to intervene and also thinking about potential barriers that might threaten the success of intervention programs. While we're not proposing or giving you the answer of what a program should look like, we do want to raise questions about potential barriers to program success, but also use the ecological framework to think about assets, thinking about what strengths or assets communities and children have and how we can utilize that to improve some of the outcomes uh, some of the outcomes might be related to the social emotional development of youth. Uh, maybe we're interested in improving outcomes relative to academic achievement and so on. If we think about sort of the goal of the justice system, specifically with juvenile justice, ultimately we're trying to function in the best in interest of the child. And we can think about the justice system in terms of a one-pot approach. So while they will be assessing the needs and addressing the needs of those who will be labeled as delinquents, there's also part of the philosophy of the juvenile justice system will begin to think about the, those who might be at risk for interventions and also those who might be engaged or involved in the child welfare system. And sometimes having parents who are incarcerated oftentimes puts you um, sort of at risk for coming in contact with other social systems and agencies. So it's very critical that um, regardless of what ecological lens that we um, use or however we sort of break down uh, the way we think about the ecology of uh, the social issue that we're discussing today, it's very important, um, at least I'm advocating, that we constantly think about the a child and we revisit the goals of the justice system, uh, specifically our responsibility for young children. So in thinking about that, um, we have to consider the way in which parents and families might pose um, be an asset to improving outcomes of young children as well as potential, uh, potential barriers. And one barrier that we do see that come up when we talk about parents and families and their role in making sure they're, supporting, uh, they're able to support their children is providing resources for the caregiver uh, once that parent has been removed.
if we sort of move along um, and think about community services and delivering services, uh, there's also something that we've discussed a little bit of making sure that every point in which a parent has come in contact with the system uh, that we're asking and considering their status as a parent and getting a good assessment of what the family dynamic looks like and not just thinking about correctional services like parent support groups, but also what services might look like upon exit um, of the prison system. When we think about barriers that get in the way of some of the programs I showed you before, uh, like visitation or special visitation, uh, some barriers that come up uh, will focus or are specific to the institutions. Um, oftentimes, uh, parents are gonna be placed far away in rural areas, and this poses concern because the location itself becomes very difficult uh, to get children to and from. So even if we wanna enhance current programs that exist, like visitation, we're going to have to really reconsider what this means in terms of placement and thinking about what community facilities and or residential programs are available or suitable uh, for some individuals so that we can make sure uh, that um, all children at least have access to those types of programs. Last but not least, um, we again have to think about various societal issues and concerns. We talked a little bit about stigma today but I would like to sort of step back and also pose we, um, our need to sort of think about society's role in the criminal justice system, uh, specifically about reform and really thinking about what are our goals of corrections. So when individuals come in contact with corrections, are we going to have a punishment model or rehabilitation model? Is our goal to punish that individual? It's about retribution, deterrence, and then what does that look like? Some would argue, including myself, that what we're doing currently with the justice system isn't working, even if our goal is deterrence or punishment. Oftentimes, people are exiting with many needs and there's not a lot of resources in the area of prison reentry. Uh, so with that said, we have to uh, really reconsider, do we wanna have a liberal or conservative approach around uh, criminal justice? And if that's so, uh, we might lean more towards rehabilitation. And if rehabilitation is our, co our goal or focus, then the child is gonna be at the center, again, of that ecological model or conversation. So all that being said, um, so what this kind of highlights is that there is a need for more effective research on child outcomes, child-specific, child-focused outcomes. Because most of the work done so far has been on kind of looking at what we can do with parents and what, it, what the impact is on parents. But there's less knowledge about kind of how do we work with the children who've been incarcerated um, and looking at child outcomes more, more concretely. Um, the, the, the kind of look also kind of highlighted there, kind of what are the unique child, parent, contextual um, factors that might play a role in, uh, in children as they develop. So, you know, you, we talk about personal environment fit, but, you know, what fits for me might not fit for someone else. And so how do we adapt our work recognizing that there's this issue going on? Um, and there are um, clear methods that can be used to evaluate the effectiveness that kind of impact outcome, um, who the population, outcome on the, all the population of interests are, um, what, what is success and um, identifies the actions of the program that are positive in the results that are there. So hopefully kind of this, these conversations kind of expand beyond the individual to kind of think about the cascade and effects of the systems that the, the child might be embedded in or the family might be embedded in or the person who's been incarcerated might be embedded in to kind of think about how do we support society's functioning kind of from a larger perspective in a better way. So that's us. <laughs> We've also been asked to remind people to speak directly into the microphone by the uh, organizers. So a couple of months on the rights of the child issue. I'm glad that you raised that and it's a very important issue. So a couple of months ago I got a 
packet in the mail, and it was by a fellow who'd written a kind of a, mo a monograph on uh, that issue related to prison nurseries. And it went back to somebody earlier today said, we don't lock up three-year-olds, but we do lock up three-month-olds. Yep. And so it's, you know, there's different ways to think about prison nurseries and the rights of children. And this particular fellow was taking a side that usually you don't see written about so much, but he was pretty passionate about it. So um, just curious what thoughts you might have about that, because I guess a lot of what I'm thinking about here is that there are fundamental issues that you all are raising about what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. And we have different points in view in our society about that. <laughs> and so, you know. You know, I guess the, and I, I know my colleagues are going to can comment on this, too, on this too, the thing that's there is that we, all, we know that, and I think, you know, earlier we were talking about how um, the focus is now moved to kind of families and they're asking families to do more because somehow it's a, uh, seen, as, seen as a magic bullet. One of the things that that brought to mind for me is that some of the research shows that if you have a social support system, you're less likely to recidivate. So they're saying, oh, let's build what's the best support system, that's family. But the reality that comes up there is if family can't really support this individual, it's for not. And so we have to kind of think about how do we um, build supports around those individuals. I know your question had to do with children who were um, who are three month old and babies that are incarcerated and you know um, the question that, that that comes up is is that fair to the child you know and we would argue that you know my personal opinion is that it's not you know and um, so what then do we do how do we create an environment that either, if the person has to be locked up is as close to normal as possible so that you know the child could kind of live all those um, pieces and then go from there so I just want to say something about the locking up um, children. I actually think that when we look at outcomes internationally, that prison nurseries actually have some of the best outcomes. And so we can say what's fair for the child. Well, what's fair for the child is to have a family. And if locking the, the child up when they're an infant um, actually is going to improve longer term outcomes for both mother and child, then I think that is fair. And I will also say that in other countries, the setting of the prison environment looks much different. So it doesn't look like our prisons here in the US where maybe I wouldn't want my children with me. Um, but in some of the, the places like in Australia and other countries, like they look more like houses and their dorms, they're, you know, they're much nicer settings where you're not necessarily behind a locked door and a gate. Um, so it's just a very different environment. Um, but I, that's where I would stand on that issue. So I want to tie in um, this point about the rights of the child and the UN and something that Sarah brought up earlier this morning about how little we know about decisions that are being made throughout the court process. Um, I have heard in my work with mothers that judges have made decisions um, about their sentence depending on their pregnancy status. We hear sort of anecdotes all the time about um, individuals' sentences being altered if they find out, you know, if the judge finds out that this is the mother um, of three kids at home or these sort of variations in sentences without a clear understanding of how judges are making those decisions um, and not a whole lot of work that I'm aware of in which the child's interest is taken into consideration at the parent's time of sentencing. Certainly Urban's work on family impact statements comes to mind here and thinking about that integrating into that part of the criminal justice system. And then I consider you know, the foster care side of things. I'm looking forward to tomorrow's talks, but thinking about the way um, children's best interest is constantly weaved into child protection hearings and foster care hearings and why we don't have a similar model thinking about children's best interest at the time of a parent's criminal sentencing. So just some reflections. Oh, and Mark wants it back. Uh, so it is, uh, so in Washington State where I've worked the last five years, we do have this parenting alternative sentencing program. And so over the last five years, there's been about, I think I was talking to the director this the other day, it's 500 and something parents who have been sentenced not to go to prison or to leave prison a year early because of what was in the best interest of the child, although mm -hmm. 
that's written into the, the legislation, but it doesn't apparently mean what it normally means. But anyway, it makes the committee that makes these decisions struggle with that issue of what's best for the kid. So anyway, they've been doing this for a while and have some promising outcomes. So or an Oregon legislator wrote a bill last year that got passed, so now they're doing it in Oregon <laughs> <laughs> too. It is, it's interesting, but it's... Uh, so that is, I mean, that's the closest example I've seen because it's actually in the law that you're supposed to think about that particular issue, which is interesting. Well, that's what, what we were trying to do is get a cross-state kind of evaluation thing going. We haven't got anybody interested in it yet, but we're trying. And with that, not um, that I will answer this question, but when we think about what's in the best interest of a, a child, um, it, it, uh, questions that come up is um, how do we determine that, especially for very young children? So you have this age component that makes this question more complicated. You know, who gets to define, you know, what is good or what is best? And so there's a lot of questions that go into that conversation in this age, right? That range will be, um, make a big difference in what the best interest looks like. I just wanted to pick up on the nursery question again, and um, the, again, the best interest of the child, and when we substitute judgment for young children, and does the three-month-old know that they're in prison? No, they know whether they have their mom there with them. So I think the child-centered perspective you know, is important, and it was actually years ago, Chris, when you and I were in Delaware, um, presenting that um, the head of the, I think, prison system was being asked to build a prison nursery. And he said something that reminds me of what Sarah challenged us about, is thinking outside of this paradigm of incarceration. He said, I believe prison nurseries are good, but if I have one, they're going to send me women who should not be in prison. They're going to send me women who are pregnant, who may have challenges, who should not be in my prison nursery. So I don't want one because it will be full. And they should be with their babies, but in the community and not in my prison. And I thought that was a brilliant. Um, we don't. We shouldn't fall into like most of most women who are in prison shouldn't even be in prison. And um, the executive, former executive director of the Women's Prison Association, challenges us to say like, who are the women who are dangerous and who are we mad at? You know, who maybe had the greatest fall from grace? Like you talked about, the, like the social constructs of motherhood and masculinity and all mm -hmm. of this. Um, and then just, I'm so happy that you talked about um, children's rights. And there is, of course, the Children of Incarcerated Parent Bill of Rights. <laughs> you all know about that. Um, and to speak to your point about like the voices of those directly affected, that was developed by children, you know, with the guidance of grown-ups. Um, and I think it pushes also this question of how does policy and research relate? And that was, it's so interesting, a couple of the presentations, two of them use slides from the Prison Policy Initiative. And there is this intimate relationship between policy and research, and there should be. And I think it's just an ongoing question for all of us to think about. You know, policy depends on the research. Research has very important policy implications. And, and we've talked about a lot of system changes that should happen. You know, prisons should be closer, so visits should happen. And when we know what interventions are good for kids, that means that the criminal justice system needs to shift um, all along, in every, at every point, arrest, you know, um, pre-detention, um, jails, prisons, the whole gamut, so. Can I jump in with a comment as well? Um, so in my own research in jails, I want to just put this caveat out here through my qualitative interviews, that the best interest of the child and the best interest of the parents can be very complicated and conflicting. Yes. So even yes. in couples who I spoke with where the mother was still together with the father and they were both trying to figure out what was best for the children, the mother often refused to take the child to visit because she decided that visiting itself was going to be more harmful for the child, even though that meant cutting off access to the father or even denied to the child where the father was. So I think it's worth keeping in mind that the best interest of the child may be not having access to the incarcerated parent in some contexts. You, you know, it, it, it also raises, I think, this interesting it raises this interesting question for me because I think that there are times when reflexively we think of exposing children to their parent who might be incarcerated might be not good for them and, and we want to protect kids from that. 
But there is a little, some research that shows that even after a dad has been incarcerated and he gets involved in his child's life, um, long term, if he's healthy, that child still fares better than a, a dad who, um, who, who's, who's this kid who doesn't have a, a father in his life. So, so, so there are ways in which I think we have to do some psychoeducation on a community level that can help folks begin to think about, so what are you trying to protect a child from? And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we can say carte blanche that every child should not visit their children or should visit their children, but I think that we have to be judicious as we weigh um, th that decision in, in a real way. And I know Bonner wants to jump in. <laughs> so I also think that this is where we have to think about shifting the where we're intervening. Because there are jails, and I actually worked in Cook County Jail in Chicago for two years, um, where they have a program for women who are mothers, and children are bypassed through the whole entry process. And there's a nice playroom that you wouldn't even know is in a prison. It looks nothing like the rest of the facility. Um, and that was a policy change that was intentionally done to allow, to have caregivers bring their kids to this huge, terrible jail um, because they didn't want to do that. So I think that, you know, it's not, sometimes we have to think just bigger. Like, how can we make this a more friendly environment for kids and not have, you know, their diapers searched or have to wait in line with 200 people on a hot afternoon. I mean, you know, like we have to think about that and be more responsive to their needs structurally, not necessarily at the individual level. Well, I mean, it gets back to what we were just talking about, Derek, before your talk. If, if the elephant in the room is mass incarceration, mm -hmm that there's too many people incarcerated. And so, you know, intervention has to be at, at that level as well as reducing incarceration. And then at the second level, reducing harm, that you don't want interventions to be more harmful than the problem. And then this issue around visitation, I mean, there are contraindications to visitation. I just showed research this morning that shows problems with it is linked to child trauma symptomology. It's a proximate reminder. So when we think of tr child trauma, we often think of witnessing arrest, but it's often entering these facilities, having to leave these facilities mm -hmm. can be very emotionally painful. And, and the point about these multiple realities, I think the research is pretty clear that most parents seem to benefit from visitation, even though there's one or two studies, one in particular that shows mothers become more depressed. depressed. So it's, uh, it, it depends. Um, the research is pretty mixed on um, visitation and children because there's so much variation in terms of the settings, the kind of visitation, the age of the children, the nature of those relationships. So, you know, I think this conference is, and, and it, I'm all for it, it's very focused on the idea of how to promote human development, how to, you know, develop those interventions. But, you know, mass incarceration has created this need for these interventions. And I know, we know who you're talking about. <laughs> we wrote a paper on it. <laughs> the paper that's been referred to is by Jim Dwyer, also at the College of William Mary, where I'm at. It's called Jailing Black Babies. And um, it takes a very um, uh, contentious, thank you, um, Stance and it really attacks the work. I, I think the good work, the peer review work of Mary Byrne and her colleagues, and um, and it was published in the Utah Law Review. So for whatever that's worth, um, yeah, that's an important. And assessment. you know, and Jim is a colleague of mine, and I have had conversations with him. I've had him in my class. Um, I've had lunch with him. Um, you know, he believe it or not, considers himself a very strong child advocate. And he just really pushes that button to kind of further that discussion for child advocacy um, in this regard. And one example he uses that, you know, resonates with me to a certain extent is that if you had a friend who came to you and said, well, I'm in this relationship with, you know, a fella or whomever, with a partner who, you know, he does these terrible things to me, as that person, you know, beats me or, or something, that as a friend, you would say, well, leave, right? leave. That's ex what you should do immediately. Um, you know, in some instances, 
if a child is involved with a parent who has a, a history of being maltreatment, do we <laughs> try to reunify that relationship or, or force them to go visit? And, you know, I think, again, it's an extreme and contentious point of view, but, you know, on the other side, I don't know how much the child's rights are in our decisions about programming, who should get programming, who should be involved in programming, and if a child wants to attend programming or be a part of that, so. Uh, but but I, I, I think that um, in an ideal world, you know, clearly we also put the idea that children wouldn't have to go to prisons to visit parents and stuff like that. And I do agree that if they we're talking about harm um, enacted by that parent, onto a child, and, and that's on a, a lingering issue. The question is about whether or not um, you you know that child should be exposed to that parent in, in a meaningful way. But, but one of the things that um, I, I, I think about is that Oliver Williams and Jeff Edelson wrote a book a number of years ago about fathers who, who are perpetrators of domestic violence. And in one of the focus groups that kind of began that book uh, the women who were victims of domestic violence talked about, I don't want to be with that man, but I do want him to be a father to my children. And so in that way, even when there are times that, you know, he might be um, caustic for me, uh, the women still have hope, which is, I think, have become a critical thing, that some intervention will help that man be a better father to his children, and we can then move on beyond that. Um, I'm not saying expose these children to, again, not healthy relations, healthy situations, but there might be times when that kid still is trying to figure out, how do I build a relationship with that, that person that's a parent? And so we have, to fig we have to have them kind of determine how they do that or not, you know? And that's a hard, conversation to have and a hard thing to negotiate given the risks that we know that are out there. Um, and, it, and it brings in other issues too because, you know, if we're talking about child welfare populations, you know, what, one of the biggest factors, one of the biggest things that they talk about in that literature is about child temperament characteristics and its impact on the experience of child welfare involvement. And so, so we have to kind of think about how we wrestle with all these pieces that are there. You know, I might be innately resilient, <laughs> there's that word again, but you know, you know, my sister who's next to me might not, and so how do we kind of recognize that there, there might be need, for, be need for different approaches around, along that lines. So I'm not standing between us and happy hour. <laughs> 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 Good first day, see you guys at happy hour. Woo!